Hey guys, I'm Elizabeth McCravey, a website designer and business coach for entrepreneurs and your host for the Breakthrough Brand Podcast, the show that's all about pulling back the curtain on how to actually build a successful business. I don't skim the surface around here. If you want a deep dive into the nitty gritty details of what it takes to run a successful business and stand out in a crowd, you're in the right place. After creating a multiple six figure a year website design business in my 20s, I'm ready to share everything I've learned and everything I'm still learning because I believe the keys to building a thriving business should never be a secret. Here you'll find episodes that are actionable, direct, and fun, like friends chatting business over coffee and a fresh, honest take on the reality of being an entrepreneur. If you're ready to master online marketing, branding, website design, mindset, and business strategy, then this is the podcast for you. It's time to build your breakthrough brand. Let's do this. All right, guys, so I'm really excited for this episode. And this is a part one and part two, because it's just so much stuff that I felt like I needed to divide it up into two episodes. So in my waitlist survey for my new program that I announced the name of last week, Booked Out Designer, there was a spot in that like survey of asking like, what do you guys want in the course? There's a spot to ask me anything. And you guys sent some really good questions. And as I was reading through them the other day, I was like, I need to do a podcast with some of these. So I had about 100 people fill out the survey. Many people put even more than one question and the questions were incredible and they truly are influencing like so heavily what is going into this course. But again, like I was reading over them, like this would be fun to do a podcast episode about. So here between this week and next week, I'm going to be covering 20 questions that you guys sent in about my design business specifically and building a design business. We talk about when I first started out, things I'd changed, what I felt like the keys were to getting six figures, all kinds of stuff. So design you definitely want to listen to this episode and next week's. But even if you're not a designer, I would still encourage you to listen to this because there is so much good stuff for you here just as a business owner. And if you've been curious of like what the backstory of my business is and my tips for things like going full time in your business, what to focus on early on, um, what my workflows were like with clients when I first started out, so many different questions. Um, How do you hold on to patience when looking for clients? That's a great one we're going to talk about today. So if that kind of stuff interests you too, you'll want to tune in even as a non-designer. But if you're a designer, you've got to listen to this one. So let's dive in. All right, you guys, so real quick before we get into these questions, I wanted to just remind you or tell you if you didn't know yet, but my program booked out designer, which is for designers, as you could guess, it opens up for founding members on Monday, February 22nd. So super soon, depending on when you're listening to this, it might actually be open right now. And for the founding members, I'm limiting it to just 30 spots and you need to get on the wait list to hear about it. So I'm not going to be, I will be posting about it on social media because you know, I got to share about what I'm working on, but um, I'm not going to be like sharing the direct link to join on Instagram or anything like that. And the emails will only be going out to the wait list. So if you're interested go to elizabethmccravey.com slash waitlist and get on that list so that you don't miss the information about this program. Um, You're not committing anything by getting on the waitlist, but you'll be able to hear about it when it opens. So definitely go sign up for that. And again, next Monday, I'm so stoked. And if you're listening to this way into the future, then just click the link in the show notes and go check out the program. Okay, now let's get into these questions. You guys sent them in. I'm not going to reference who sent any of them because I did not save all that when I inputted this into my outline. But again, you guys sent these people who are interested in the program and I seriously love them so much. It was hard picking. Again, there were a hundred people who filled out this form and almost everyone submitted at least one question. So there's a lot. So let's start with this first one. This was actually a really common one and I'm going to read two different people's ways they asked it. So the question is, if you were starting over again, what would you do differently in your design business? What would you avoid or skip entirely? And then someone else phrased it like, what is something you would do differently if you had to restart your business over again? So kind of two different perspectives there, but I really loved this. And oh, it was kind of hard thinking of stuff a little bit, to be honest, because even though I've made plenty of mistakes and there's plenty of things I would technically change, I think they all played a role in building my business. So part of me is like, I'm glad I went through that. Like that was important. But some things that I'm like, I really just wish I would have done differently. The main one is that I wish I would have just gone with my own name instead of trying to make up a name for my business. So there's obviously nothing wrong with using like a made up business name besides your own name. 
But, you know, I ultimately ended up being just Elizabeth McCravey as my business name. And I'm really happy about that. I've been that for a few years now. But early on, I started under one business name. And then I rebranded to another made up business name and then eventually to my own name. So I wish I would have started out clean cut with my own name. And again, I'm still glad I did it that way because it all worked out in the end. But it would have been nice not to have changed everything later on. So that's the first thing. Second thing I would have done differently I would probably have invested sooner in education for my business. So I actually did not do any courses or masterminds or anything for a long time in my business. Like I did not invest in stuff. I didn't buy courses. I didn't buy little one-off programs. Like I was very, very um, spending savvy, I guess you could say. And I think there's like good in that and also bad in that. And I think I could have moved quicker had I bought a really good program or coaching sooner in my business. But again, I don't necessarily regret it, but that is something where I'm like, I kind of wish I would have done it sooner. And I didn't even think I realized that there was stuff like that was also a piece of it maybe, but that's something I wish I would change. And I did, I will say I did consume a lot of free education, like definitely early on in my business and still to this day alongside stuff I actually invest in. But I recommend free education as much as possible. Um, Things like, you know, podcast, free webinars. I would put books kind of in there even because that's such a low cost compared to a course, but you definitely want to always be learning. So that's one thing. And then the third thing I would change is I would have started building relationships with other designers and business owners sooner. Uh, That's something else I kind of took a while to really start doing. I was very much like early on in my own little solo box, didn't really know other people in my industry locally or like globally, did not really know people. And I was very isolated for a while. So I wish I would have kind of pursued those types of friendships sooner because obviously I had plenty of friendships who were not business owners, but I mean, kind of pursuing networking with other business owners, I think that would have helped me sooner. Um, And the last thing, just a real quick one here, I would have started showing my face on stories sooner because I waited way too long to do that and was hiding behind my made up business name and little graphics and stock images and like barely showing my face or any personality and was just kind of like, this is why I have to do it. You have to be like more corporate-y. And I wish I would have changed that sooner. So that's number one. All right, number two, there were also a lot of variations of this one. You'll realize that most of the questions I picked, people were asking over and over again. So this one, how do you think outside the box and make websites that don't just look like every other website? And then someone else asked, how do you get inspired to create a unique design that stands out from the norm? So there's so many ways to do this. Like, again, I could do a whole episode on this. and I'll actually have a whole video in the course on this and how to get inspired with it as a designer without copying that's a huge key here. Do not copy other designers. Okay, so here are some tips that I live by as a designer. One, um, so say I'm designing a website for a life coach. I've worked with plenty of life coaches um, and still do with my template shop. So let's say that's the client. I do not go on Pinterest and type in life coach website for inspiration. Actually, it's funny. If I did that right now, a lot of the ones I would see would be my own work because I end up ranking on Pinterest for that. But anyway, instead of doing that, I go to other brands that are unrelated to the coaching industry that relate to how my clients want the feeling for their brand to be. And I look there for inspiration. So I'm really relying on what I hear from the client from our client meetings and what they put in their questionnaire and looking to those sources for inspiration versus like what everyone else thinks a life coach website needs to be like because they're a life coach, but really pulling from like what inspires them. What do they want people to feel like when they're on their website? Um, Another thing I say off Pinterest, generally speaking, when website designing, um, actually, let me rephrase that. I say off Pinterest for when it comes to looking at websites. So when I'm on Pinterest, again, like I'm not typing in life coach websites or business coach or yoga teacher website or whatever to find out like, what should I do design wise? Instead, I'm focusing on print design, email marketing design a lot, and things like that, which some of it comes from Pinterest. And some of it would come from like literally holding a magazine and looking at it. So I think getting inspiration outside of other websites is going to help you be more creative as a designer. And then another note, I do always look at my clients' competitors' websites. So I always ask, like, who do you think your top competitors are? Ask them what their opinion on that is. And I also will try to research and kind of think about, like, who do I think their top competitors are? And I always look at it, but never from a, like, oh, that's how it needs to be done. We need to be like them. We need to do that same thing. But instead, from, like, a researching perspective and actually seeing, like, 
like, how can we stand out from this and do something completely different and unique? So um, those are a few tips. Again, I could give like a thousand more, but trying to keep these answers kind of short. Okay, so the third one, they said initial client communication, what information do you ask for when you start working with a client specifically when building a new website for a client? So I asked for a lot of stuff, but actually not too much stuff that it overwhelms the client. If you listen to last week's episode, I talk about this, about how I think the client process does not need to be overcomplicated. And I think sometimes we think that more stuff is more value and that's not always true. So I do ask a lot of questions and do get a lot of things from them though, but do it in a way that's simple and not overwhelming. So I typically with a project am scheduled, actually not typically, every time, let me phrase it that way, I'm scheduling a project start date. So they will have a kickoff date and a due date for their homework, which are two different things. I'd highly recommend not making those on the same day. The kickoff day would be like when I'm starting to work on the project or doing a call with them or something like that. And then the due date would be like a week or two before that, ideally. And they'll get reminders from me to get the homework. And if it's delayed, then they don't get to start the project on time. Like it's a very like, you got to get this in. Um, so some things I asked for, this isn't extensive, but this is kind of what comes to mind. So I get all of their logins and their Facebook pixel, Pinterest pixel, Google Tag Manager, Google Analytics, any like type of thing. I'm trying to think if there are others like that type of stuff though, that you like are embedding onto a website to, for tracking. I always like to get all that up front because I like to put it on the website on the front end so that I'm not, um, it's a long story. If you show it, you'll know what I mean. But I like to get all that up front and make sure I understand like what all are they tracking and that sort of thing. So I get them to send me all of that, which a lot of times includes like logins, like I said. Um, I'll get people's like email marketing login, their current website hosting login, um, domain login, all that stuff. And they have a questionnaire for onboarding that they'll fill out about their business and their goals for the new website and brand. And I use the same questionnaire for every client and I'll edit it slightly if needed. Like if there's a question where I'm like, this doesn't really apply to them or I already know the answer, I delete it. Because again, I want it to be simple for the clients. And then I do a shared secret Pinterest board where they pin inspiration and so do I. And then there's a huge key here. So many designers do Pinterest boards, but the thing I do after the Pinterest boards on our kickoff call, I'll talk about the why behind what they pin. So instead of just being like, they pinned this thing, cool. I ask, why did you pin that? What did you like about it? And really dig deep and get them to like answer the tougher questions. And I also typically ask my clients not to pin logos and other websites because I think it's there's other things I ask for instead that are ways for them to show what inspires them besides that. And then on my own end, I research the heck out of every client before starting. So if they have a podcast, I'm listening to it. If they've been a guest on other podcasts or YouTube shows or whatever, I listen to those and watch those. Again, their email list, I read their Facebook ads. I will watch their YouTube videos. I will just Google them and see what comes up. Like if they were in any random articles or guest blogging for someone or you know, look at their personal Facebook page, even like I'll stalk their Instagram, like I just get to know them on a deep level. And that's something that like, you're kind of doing behind the scenes. Like I don't I'm not telling the clients, hello, today, I'm listening to you on a podcast episode, I'm just doing it and making sure I get really, really familiar with them. And I do this even for clients that I'm already familiar with, like I've had the joy and privilege really to in recent years, especially work with a lot of clients who I actually was either familiar with them from their podcast or like f legitimately friends with them beforehand. And I still do this, like really just digging deep into getting to know them. So those are a few things that I asked for in that initial client communication. All right, question number four, how did you take the leap from a full-time job with a steady income to building your business? And I also had a few people like sharing their specific story about this and asking for advice on that, which is hard. That's the time where I'm like, join my program and we can do coaching on that. But to kind of generalize this, I actually do in-depth business story on episode one of this podcast. Also be kind to me if you go back and listen to it, because I definitely feel like I was very much not familiar with podcasting yet at that point. So I probably sound a bit more like rehearsed than I do now, but that's a good episode if you want to hear like me talk about my business story in depth. But to give you a little 
sneak peek into full-time job study salary to building a business. So I got a really great job in graphic design and advertising agency here in Nashville right out of college. So I, I graduated college, got this job, and then I got married a few months later. So it was a lot of life change at once. And I was really excited about the job. And at the time of my life, like graduating college, I was like really looking forward to like the big city life in Nashville. I grew up in a small town in Tennessee. And so I'm like, okay, that's going to be cool. And then I was excited about the idea of corporate life, like something about it. I don't know. I think I like glamorized a lot to now at this point in my life. I'm like, I can't believe I thought that, but that's how I felt. And corporate life is definitely for some people, but now I know it's not for me. So anyway, I thought I'd start a business someday, but I was like, not right out of college, not now, maybe someday. And I had no idea what the business would even be. I just always have like thought that'd be something I would do. And while I was at this corporate job and actually all of college, just about not all of college, probably like three out of four years of college. And then again, while at this job, I was actually freelancing a lot um, and making like a decent income doing it, considering that I had a full time job. So like not enough to be a full income, but like I'm bringing in some extra money doing this. And I loved freelancing like I loved it in college. I loved it at this job. And I was doing it for fun, generally speaking. So I started hating my job once like the newness and excitement wore off, which for me only took like three months for the newness to wear off. And I mean, there's so many things I didn't love about it. Like I hated feeling tied to a desk all day. Um, and a lot of the corporate environment of it, it just really wasn't for me. And I did not like that I had to be there regardless of if there was work to do. So there's a lot of things contributing to it. And I also think I'm grateful that this was true, but I think something else contributing to it is like, it was such a huge season of change for me. Like I just graduated college, moved to a brand new city. I was living alone in an unfurnished apartment. Um, I actually totaled my car the day I moved to Nashville, which was a whole nother thing. And I started this job two days later. I'm planning a wedding from a distance. And my wedding was not an easy time in my life, you guys, not because anything would mean Adam, but planning it was stressful. I had a super, super tight budget. And it was just not that fun. So anyway, I was kind of having a lot of stress in my life. And I think that probably contributed to the job being harder, which again, I'm grateful because I think I was totally meant to quit that job. But anyway, so I was not loving it. And I was like, okay, I think I'm just gonna like quit, I'm gonna find another job first, and then quit. And so I read the company handbook, I read the part about quitting. And I was coming up on four months and my boss started talking to me about having a longer term contract because at the time I was actually there covering someone's maternity leave with like the promise that it probably turned into something longer. But, um, you know, I wasn't sure yet. So he offered me the longer term contract and I ended up quitting instead. And I thought I had 30 days notice because that's what it said in the company handbook. So he offers me the job longer. And then I say, actually, I would like to quit. I literally cried while I quit because I never quit a job before. I always tried to phase myself out prior to this, which is kind of funny because I had a lot of different jobs in college and just again, always phased myself out. So I quit and left that day unemployed. And it was totally shocking to me, kind of stressful, but also just felt really light and excited about all the possibilities ahead. Um, but at that time, we really needed my income. So we were newlyweds with zero savings. My husband was on a first year ministry salary that was super low paying. And like I said, I totaled my car the day I moved to Nashville. So I had a new car payment that was unexpected. Um, we had an apartment to furnish, like with student loan debt, all kinds of stuff. It was not a great time to not have a job. So I applied for jobs, like went, like wild applying for design, advertising jobs, all the things all over Nashville. Did not hear back from any of them. And in the meantime, I was freelancing. And with the clients I already had and then getting new ones and like literally days after quitting my job, I started getting jobs on Upwork, doing all kinds of random design stuff. Like I remember the first project I ever did was like, I think it was like, if I remember correctly, it was for a yoga brand, but they had like a booth at some sort of expo and it was the design to go like above their booth. So it's just like random stuff like that. And I was probably paid like $30 to do that. So it was like, I was just taking whatever I could doing random stuff. And pretty quickly, I ended up signing two monthly retainer clients for social media management and something to know about me in college, actually an internship at a public relations agency, where I did social media management. So that was something where it was like, made a lot of sense and something I knew how to do. And then I started nannying, I went to back to teaching yoga two times a week. And I was hustling, like I was just doing all the different things I could to make money. And so that's one thing there, like, hear me say that I was like, like 
doing a lot of different things at first to make it all work. Um, so when I was nannying during like the kids sleeping, I would work on freelance stuff. I actually started a blog during this time, which I don't know if I've ever talked about that in this podcast, but I started a blog um, called Life by Elizabeth. And I was thinking like, I might do like lifestyle blogging. And I don't know, I just, I had all kinds of different interests and that did not pan out. And I pretty quickly gave up on the blog about the time that I started my business. But anyway, I eventually found a rhythm between like my nannying jobs and the freelance work. And I got two pretty big freelancing gigs through referrals and networking with other people. And then eventually I quit most of my nannying jobs, but I held on to one that was like an everyday job from like 5.45 to 8 a.m. Um, and so it was really nice. I took the kids to school and then I would start work. And so I kept that job for a really long time, partially because I just loved that family and the job got me awake in the morning. And again, it was like good pay and helped me like know I had always that income to rely on, even if um, I didn't book any clients that month. So I did that for a while. And then about eight months after that, I quit all the nannying. And that's when I like went full time into my business. And at some point while I was nannying was when I like officially launched my website and things like that. So it was like very gradual and kind of convoluted of it all happening. But that's my story with, with how it happened. And, you know, I did not match the income from my day job immediately. I did match it fairly quickly when you combined the money I was making from nannying. Um, and then maybe like a few months later, I started matching like monthly just through design work. I don't know. I can't remember the exact dates and stuff, but that's, that's how I took the leap. And everyone's story is so different. So I encourage you to like ask other people um, and not feel like someone else's story has to be yours. Um, but yeah, that's my story with it. And again, it's, it's different than a lot of other people's, but also probably really relatable to a lot of you. So that's my answer there. Interrupting this episode with a suggestion for the small business owners listening. Ever wonder what you should do for healthcare when you and your spouse are both self-employed so there's no work provided health insurance to participate in? Well, when my husband Adam joined me in the entrepreneurial job space over four years ago, we joined Christian Healthcare Ministries instead of getting traditional health insurance. And it was the best decision for us, especially in these years of growing and raising a family while also running multiple businesses. CHM is a health cost sharing ministry and is a faith-based alternative to health insurance. We did tons of research before choosing CHM. And if you know me and Adam, you know, we are all about doing the math when making big or small financial decisions. And even though it's not insurance, CHM shares 100% of eligible medical bills, which is more than the typical 70 or 80% of medical bills paid for by insurance companies. All sharing is determined by the CHM guidelines, which you can check out before and after joining. And for the mamas and mamas to be listening, you truly cannot find a better healthcare option for maternity care. I had a vaginal delivery and a C-section and birth center care and hospital care between my two pregnancies and births, and it was all 100% shared for. And outside of birth, we've had our share of emergency room visits and procedures as a family, and those costs were all shared by members at Christian Healthcare Ministries, leaving us only paying our monthly contribution. CHM is less expensive month to month than insurance, and because there's no network, you can choose your care with whichever providers best fit your family. I seriously just cannot recommend Christian Healthcare Ministries enough. You've got to check them out. Go to elizabethmccravey.com slash CHM for more information. Also putting that link in the show notes, elizabethmccravey.com slash CHM. Now back to the episode. Hey there, I have a fast update for you on this episode and something free I think you'd probably enjoy checking out. So you heard me say earlier that Booked Out Designers beta launch was happening soon. Well, that time has come and gone. I had an amazing beta launch in February of 2021. I actually recorded a whole podcast episode talking about that. And since that time, we've had over 100 students go through Booked Out Designer. Guys, this course is incredible. If you love this podcast, you'll love the course. If this podcast has helped you grow your business in any way, I believe this course will absolutely do the same for you. And fun thing, you can actually join it right now. So first to tell you a little bit about Book.Designer, it's a course with over 90 video lessons, tons of downloads and different systems to utilize. And it's also a coaching program and community. So you get coaching calls with me included and access to our awesome Facebook community as well, where you can ask questions and network with other designers. So 
in the course, I cover things like really what we're talking about in this episode, things like how to start your business in the first place, creating a powerful website as a designer, um, how to cultivate an amazing client experience and relationships with our clients. We talk about content marketing, the financial side of your business, and so much more. So students are literally calling it the best course I've ever taken. Thank you, Erica, for that feedback. Um, Heather says Booked Out Designer is the most comprehensive course out there about building a successful design business. Elizabeth leaves no secret unshared, providing specific stories and examples and actual takeaways with each lesson. Um, So back to the topic, though, of something free for you. You can actually sample two lessons from Booked Out Designer completely free, like two full length lessons. You can watch them for free and get a full preview in addition to that of what all is included in the course, like basically getting a tour of what all you'll learn. So go to elizabethmccravey.com slash sample to get your free lesson. No credit card required to do that. And if you're already like, I don't even need the free lessons, I'm ready to join. The link to join is the show notes, um, elizabethmccravey.com slash BOD will get you there. And as always, I'm here to answer any questions. So feel free to send me a DM on Instagram or email me. And I hope to see you inside the course and our um, coaching program uh, soon. So, all right, I'll get back to the episode. All right. Question number five, how do you hold on to patience when it comes to getting clients? I know it's a game of consistency, but my patience wears thin some days. So I totally get this. And I feel for the many, gosh, I mean, this was probably the most recurring thing in the survey. Um, But this is why I'm making this program for designers, um, because I think this is one of the biggest struggles and there are plenty of solutions to it. So it doesn't have to be a struggle. Um, And so for me, you might even be able to hear that a little bit in what I just talked about, but I don't feel like this was the biggest struggle I had in my business. It was actually not that big of a struggle. And I say that reluctantly because I don't want it to sound like I'm bragging because I had plenty of other business struggles, which you've heard me talk about. Um, But once I figured out a system for getting clients and how to market myself well, um, it was working and I was able to book clients. And early on, it was definitely me pursuing clients versus them just pursuing me and showing up in my inbox with their wallets out, you know, Um, but I was booking consistently fairly early on in my business. And I think one way, though, advice I'd give on holding on to patience that has worked for me is to work your goal backwards with what you think you need to do to get there. So for example, say you're like, and I did this all the time. So that's why I say this is my advice. I actually have a notebook. Y'all have heard me talk about the podcast before my business dreams journal. And I have, actually, I'm going to go look at it real quick and tell you guys about it. Okay, so I just pulled it up. So I had, I, I made like a literal like diagram. I don't even know how to explain it. But I put my, the, my big goal was to book out client calendar two to four months in advance. That is literally what I wrote. And then I wrote out the four big steps I thought I need to do to do that. And then I broke it down further into like, what are the like things under those steps? And that's what I focused on. So like I made a plan and followed the plan and basically worked the goal backwards. Like, what are all the little things I need to do? So, um, you know, kind of figuring out like how many discovery calls do you think you need to book for that number of clients? What networking do you need to do? What other marketing efforts would help you and work it all backwards? And I really do believe that at some point in your business, you'll hit a turning point where things start to get more consistent and the clients are coming to you and you're pursuing like bookings less and you'll become more in demand as a designer. It can happen. Um, but that's what I did. I worked backwards and just to even read to you guys, I haven't read this in forever, but one thing I wrote down was consistently reach out to pensional clients. And then I broke that down of like, what could that look like? Um, I wrote about building an audience um, and then I wrote down ways that that could look, um, doing guest posting and podcasting, like all kinds of stuff. So blogging, there's a lot of things on this list. So anyway, that's what I did and I worked backwards. So hopefully that can be of help to you there. All right. Number six, how did you decide to focus on just websites? I really like this question. So for me, when I first started my business, I did everything, (laughs) literally everything. I did brochures, billboards. I did your social media management. I would do your Facebook ads. I do your email marketing. I do your branding, your website, literally anything. And I actually found my original service page a few months ago that I'm putting like a screenshot of it in the course, but is a hoot. It's like embarrassing to me, but also like, oh my gosh, that's so common, but like the service page just listed out every kind of graphic design, every kind of marketing, like into categories. 
And um, I said I'd do it all. And so I actually don't regret offering a lot early on because it helped me figure out what I liked. And I, I didn't know what I liked. Like, I didn't know what I was going to be best at. I didn't know what I was going to prefer doing. At one point early on, I literally thought I'd run a social media management company. And if you remember my second business name, that's why I picked that name because I thought I would be like more of a marketing company. Because again, I had an internship in college where like what we did was a lot of social media management and PR and events and things like that. And I absolutely loved it. But somewhat quickly though, I started eliminating what wasn't selling from my website and then the stuff I didn't love because it did make it so convoluted. So I was simplifying and I realized, I mean, it took me a while and I kept a lot of clients for longer when I didn't enjoy this as much anymore, but I eventually realized I didn't love social media management. Um, I was struggling with a lot of the clients to get results for them as a contractor who wasn't in their business day in and day out. So it's like, I never, with a lot of them, not all of them, but with a lot of them, I felt like I never had the information I needed to do the job as well as I could, because I'm like, I'm not the owner. I'm not at your headquarters, like taking photos and stuff and things like that. And so it was just a struggle. And I feel like I was always kind of falling behind and I wasn't loving the results I was getting for people. But I had a great system for it. I really liked um, the way I planned out content calendars. I loved the retainer work. That was really nice early on. But anyway, so before websites, I actually did a lot of stuff. And then I eventually focused on branding mostly. Um, and like, so I went from like doing all the social media and all the random graphic design to then focusing more on branding. And then I started doing some branding with websites included, because again, I actually knew how to do websites from college. I studied digital media in college and like literally took a class on WordPress and I had built Squarespace sites. I built WordPress sites in college. So like I knew, I knew design stuff. Um, so when I first started adding in websites, I actually was doing WordPress sites um, alongside branding for clients. And so the question though, back to the beginning, how did you ultimately decide to focus on websites? When I discovered Show It and started using the platform, that was what made me go all in on websites because I literally became a better designer. Because like before Show It, what I had in my head of like, oh, I want to do this cool idea. I often could not do it with WordPress. Like, and that's, that's on me because I... I'm a novice coder, honestly, like I, I know how to code, but like not that great. And it was just always, it was always felt clunky to me, basically. So when I discovered show it, I had more fun designing, I became a better designer. And that's what made me go in all in on websites. And that also became what people wanted for me. So like listening to your audience, what are people booking you for and that sort of thing. That's how I decided that. So these next two really relate to that. So number seven, What's one of your favorite things about creating websites? So um, two of my favorite things. So you said one of my favorite things. I say the two ones. One thing would be when I think of something really cool to do that I haven't seen anyone else do yet. Or when I like kind of figure out something complicated that I can like make show it do that maybe it's like not meant to do. <laughs> I really like doing that. And then the second thing that's actually like my number one thing probably is seeing clients reactions to their preview sites while I'm working on it. So I'd send updates after I do a page and like get feedback and all that kind of stuff, which I'm teaching how to do it, how I do it in the course. But like hearing their feedback and their enthusiasm and like, Oh my gosh, it's seriously like what keeps me going on projects when I'm tired or when the project feels harder um, is hearing that feedback and hearing the enthusiasm and it makes me more enthusiastic. So those would be my favorite things about creating websites. And number eight, what is the main thing that catapulted your business? So a lot of variations of this one. And one of the other variations I'm going to talk about next week in the next 10 questions, but I love this question. And when I, when I read this initially, and think about the thing that catapulted my business the most. Here's what I'll say. I think going all in on website design, all in on show it would be the thing. Like that's my instinctive answer. And the truth is there's so many things that help us build our business. But I think that's the main thing. Because again, like I said, I became a better designer when I had a software that really let me have creative freedom. Um, and when I became a better designer, people liked the work I was doing more and wanted to book me more. Um, so seriously, like after I did my first few show at websites, that was when I started seeing more inquiries and more excitement. And when I started charging more, like all of that happened around the same time. And that's not a sales pitch for like why you need to use show it, but it is a sales pitch for like why going all in on something 
And like, I mean, a big piece of that too, is I took off all those other services. Like I was not doing social media management. I would not do a billboard for you. I'm not going to do your menu for your restaurant. Like I took off all the other random stuff and really was focusing on branding too, not just websites, but branding and websites. And it gave clarity to what I was offering. Um, and next week, one of the questions is about like why I chose show it. So stay tuned for that. Cause I'll talk about that more then. All right, question number nine. We're getting close to the end, you guys. So I almost don't want to answer this one, but I kept it because I think it's a good question. What's your lowest point in business story? What happened? How did you rise above it? So the reason I'm answering this question is because I actually wish more people would share this stuff instead of just the pretty wins. So here we go. Um, some of you have heard variations, of, not variations, pieces of the story, probably not the whole thing, because um, I do try to like not share it all too much to like protect privacy, I guess, of, of people involved. But the lowest point for me was a really bad client experience. It was a brand new website design project back when I was on WordPress still. Um, I have never shared this client in my portfolio or testimonials from them or anything like that. So you do not know who this client is. Any client I share about, I, I've absolutely loved working with. Um, but this was a few years ago, again, earlier on, and the client felt really dreamy to me. I was really excited to work with them. So I took on the project, even though there were a lot of red flags, which is something I'm like, watch out for the red flags. Um, but one of the red flags was actually that my dad um, told me not to do the project. He had also done business with this company and he had had a bad experience with them. Um, and so he advised me not to do it, but I was like, it's so shiny and it'll be fun. And so I took it on anyway. And basically a long story short, the project felt like it was going great the majority of the time. Um, no hiccups. Like once we started, there were still some red flags and stuff. But like generally speaking, I'm like, the client is pleased. Um, things are moving along at a good pace, like all of that was going well. And then at the end, after like when I send the final invoice, I guess, um, and when we're really like ready to launch the website, the client decided that they actually hated everything I did. And they thought it wasn't worth the price. They said I had no talent. They could have gotten the same thing for like $100 from someone else. Um, they said really mean things to me in emails. Um, we'll not get into all that. But it was really bad. Um, and I felt so discouraged from that. I literally remember feeling like I'm the worst designer in the world. Why would anyone want to work with me? Like so discouraged. That's like the moment when people have asked me, like, when's a moment where you thought about throwing in the towel? That's like the only moment that I've truly thought about throwing in the towel was this client. So I finished up the project the best I could. Um, but honestly, I did not handle the situation that well, because my pride was so hurt. Um, and I was emotionally charged at the mean things that were said to me. And I like was writing back sooner and not thinking through my responses as well as I should have, because it was a lot of like angry emailing that was happening with this client. And my dad was really helpful to me through it because again, he had dealt with the same, um, not the same stuff, but similar stuff from this company. So that was helpful and comforting. And um, he helped me a lot through that. But the project ended and everything felt okay. I'm like, okay, we made it through. Um, they launched the website. They hate me, but it's fine. <laughs> um, and then that was the worst piece of it was all that. And I felt like my confidence was really shot for quite a while after that. Um, then about two years later, <laughs> the company, this owner, he ended up putting negative reviews about me on Facebook and stuff like that. And he got mad at me about something related to his domain name. Long story, it actually not did not have anything to do with me. But he threatened to sue me. <laughs> and the last thing he said to me was, I hope God curses your business to the ground. And then I ended up blocking him everywhere. So he is still blocked to this day and his business is blocked by me. Um, but that was again, brought it all back up again, like a couple of years later, a year and a half or two years around that later. And um, I, I was feeling better about it by then. So that, that part is not the worst moment. The worst moment was finishing the project where I'm like, this is one of my first WordPress websites and this guy hates me. Like that was really rough. Um, but something I've never shared, because I actually talked about this story on episode 54 about dealing with difficult clients. Um, so that's where I said you might have heard this before. I think I shared it in less detail in that episode than I just told it. But I talk about it there. Oh my gosh, I'm like literally shaking talking about this though. But something I never share because it actually happened after that episode. But not that long ago. So literally, I guess this was 2019. I was at an event where this business owner also was. And I knew he was going to be there. Again, y'all, my heart is very sick to talk about this. Um, I knew he was going to be there. And I think he also knew I, I was there. 
Um, and when I first saw him, I felt like the same hurt and anger and like realized in that moment, like, oh my gosh, like uh, he still has a hold over my confidence and like my heart was racing and I'm like, ugh, like I do not like this person and this is hurting me being here in his presence. And I wasn't planning to, but I ended up deciding later in the event that I'm actually going to go talk to him. And I introduced myself because interesting thing with that project, we actually never saw each other face to face. We don't live in the same city. Um, we did all of our communication over email or on the phone. So he didn't, we never spoken face to face. So I went up to him and introduced myself. And um, that became, took like what was a really bad business experience and made it into something really good. Because again, this guy, the last thing he had said to me was saying, I hope God curses your business to the ground. And I won't get into the whole conversation, but basically I, you know, had the boldness to go talk to him after that happened. And through the way I very subtly communicated to him that I'm not scared of him, I do not have respect for him or his business, and I still wish him well and was not afraid of him. And it was really amazing and like a highlight of my business, honestly, as weird as that sounds. And I was actually with my dad that weekend. My dad was not at the event, but I was with him after, and I like remember going and telling him like what happened. It was like, yeah, I did it. Um, and that helps me. Like it was a really good moment. And it sounds so silly. Um, probably to many of you listening, but if you've ever had a client where it's like, they really hurt you and um, said a lot of mean things, it can feel good to like, in like, kind of like crush them with kindness, I guess you could say, because like, I was super kind to him and not say anything mean at all. And also at that same day, I ended up realizing that so many other local businesses had had similar problems with this person. And so that also helped me not feel as alone. And it was just a lot of redemption for that really hard couple of days that made me want really like a month of ending that project that made me want to quit my business. So there you go. That's kind of a long story. <laughs> but that was the lowest point in my business. And if you want to hear more about difficult client stuff, you guys I have two episodes on this. So number 54 is how to deal with difficult client situations. And if you are in a situation where you're like, I'm dealing with a difficult client, I want to cancel the project, they're being mean to me, or maybe they're just have too many demands, like whatever it is, listen to that episode. And then if you've never had a difficult client. You're like, Elizabeth, what are you even talking about? All of my clients are amazing. <laughs> Go listen to episode 55. And that's about how to prevent difficult clients. And I talk about red flags and all kinds of stuff. So those will be helpful for you. All right. And the last question on today's episode of 20 questions, which is really 10 today and 10 next week. Um, but I love this one. Best advice for new website designers in the business. Um, oh my gosh. Oh, I have so much advice. That's why I made a course. Ha ha ha. But really, um, that's why I made the course. But if I'm going to just sum up like advice in like a few sentences, one would be get education from other designers and other people who do similar things to design, like doesn't have to even just be designers. So whether you're investing in something like the course I'm making or other courses or listening to free content, like podcasts, like cannot recommend that enough. Um, reading books, um, watching free webinars. I mentioned that earlier, but just learn as much as you can. And something I always love to remind business owners is that the learning never stops. Like I, guys, I'm always learning new things for my business. And I think I will continue to do that. I use my spare time in the car all the time to listen to podcasts from people I respect and want to learn from. I listen to audiobooks sometimes, but more so I end up listening to like reading physical books about business. Like there's just, there's always room for learning. So just always be learning, um, always be growing and specifically learning from people who you want some more business to. Um, and then another tip I would give for a new designer is do what you need to do to be confident in yourself as a designer. And I say do what you need to do because I think that's different for everyone, but lacking confidence in yourself, in your business, in your design skills, all of that will hold you up so much more than you might realize because it's all subconscious and it affects the way we show up. So maybe for you, it's that you need to do more discovery calls and get more just practice under your belt of like pitching yourself to clients. Um, maybe it's that you need to become better at designing, like practicing with made up clients 
really studying design and like why something works and why something doesn't work and that sort of thing. Um, there's so many things. Maybe you need to become more confident in the way you show up on Instagram. Like, I don't know what it is for you, but whatever it is, do what you need to do to be confident in yourself. Because for me, early on, I really lacked confidence, which I'll talk about actually in this, the next episode, the next 10 questions. But I lacked confidence a lot early on for various reasons. But I think when I got past that and became confident in myself, which it took a lot of different things for me, some of the ones I just mentioned, and some other things. But once I became more confident, it really propelled my business forward. All right, guys, so that was part one of 20 questions. I hope you enjoyed all those various um, website design business questions. So this is part one. And good news, you're not gonna have to wait too long for part two. So part two will actually air next Tuesday on um, just a week from today. So one more week. Um, And so come back here for more then. And in the meantime, um, if you're listening to this live and my course booked out designer sounds interesting to you, definitely get on the wait list, elizabethmccravey.com slash wait list. I'd love for you to be a founding member. I would love to coach you. The founding members are going to get coaching with me along with some other perks as well. So definitely go check that out. Come join us. And yeah, stay tuned for the next 10 questions next week. Bye guys. Hey, thanks for listening to the podcast today and for staying until the end. I appreciate you being here. And if you enjoyed this episode, then I want to invite you to check out my online course and coaching program for designers, Booked Out Designer. In this program, I teach you how to build a successful in-demand booked out business as a designer. You'll learn everything from the exact experience I take my clients through to things like figuring out your niche, mastering discovery calls, pricing your services for profit, creating contracts that will not call you legal troubles and my exact social media strategies to book clients. You even get to watch recordings of me in actual meetings with my actual clients so you can really learn through what you're seeing. We take things you're learning on this podcast and so many topics I never even cover on the show and deep dive into them. So in addition to the amazing course, the course is nine modules of teaching with over 90 lessons. You get group coaching calls with me and access to an exclusive Facebook community of designers just like you. And fun fact, this isn't one of those kind of Facebook groups where the founder never comments on posts or you never see them in there. You'll find me there all the time ready to help you out with any business question you have. So to get info on the course and to see when the doors will be opening again, head to elizabethmccravey.com slash BOD, short for booked out designer. I hope to be able to coach you and teach you inside of the course soon. And don't forget that you can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening so that you never miss an episode. And a great way to support the show is to leave a rating and review, share it with a friend, share it on social media. All of that will help get the word out. All right, I'll see you again next week.